Okay, if I can have everyone's attention, we would like to go ahead and get started. Does everything look okay from out there? Everyone, everyone can see okay? Because I can't see anything with these lights on. I just wanna, just wanna tell you. I'd like to welcome all of you to the Johns Hopkins Athletic Hall of Fame induction ceremony. It's 2022, of course, we're honoring the class of 2020 tonight. Something got in the way and delayed us for a couple of years. For those of you that I don't know or I didn't have a chance to meet, my name is Ernie LaRossa. I'm the Director of Athletic Communications and Associate Director of Athletics here at Hopkins. It's my pleasure to serve as the MC of our Athletic Hall of Fame ceremony tonight. We have what I hope you think will be a wonderful program. We will honor nine individuals with induction into the Johns Hopkins Athletic Hall of Fame and recognize three individuals with awards for distinguished service to the Department of Athletics and Recreation. I will take a moment in a few minutes to explain exactly how things will flow, tell you what a Hall of Famer receives and exactly how the evening will proceed. But before I do that, I'd like to call forward Jennifer Baker, our Director of Athletics and Recreation, to say a few words. Jen? He's not kidding about those lights. Wow, that is bright. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm so happy to be here with you. I think one of the things that has stood out for me from the time, even this afternoon up, up in Cordish for the luncheon, is the energy around this class induction has just been awesome. And to see this many of you out here, or for that matter, not see, but know that you're there, um, it's just great. And I want to thank everyone um, for coming back. So as Ernie said, we should have done this two years ago. Obviously, we didn't. We haven't done one of these um, four and a half years now. Yeah, so it's, it's been a minute. And the last time we did it, I was not the AD. I was on the, on the staff, but not the AD. And so as we were preparing for this one, and Ernie and I were talking about what the run of show looks like and what the program looks like, he said, you know, you can come up and talk. Talk for as long as you want. It's, you know, the floor is yours, so I hope everyone topped off their drink. <laughs> um, that said, I'm really happy to be here in front of all of you tonight, and I'm really happy to be part of this event. And one of the best things I get to do as an AD is celebrate the success of all of our teams, and by extension, the hard work and commitment that goes into creating that success that's put in by our incredible student athletes, our coaches, and our support staff. But much as one win in the context of a season can't be ever considered in a vacuum, neither can collective achievement. And all that we enjoy today was made possible by everyone who's come before and who's laid a foundation on which we continue to climb. And I know, looking around the room, so many of you in this room were part of creating that foundation. Some of you are already in our Hall of Fame and obviously we will induct many new members tonight. And on behalf of our department, all 700 student athletes that we have of the Johns Hopkins University and of so many friends and family of Blue Jay Athletics, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for all of the hard work that you put in, for all that you've invested of yourselves, both while you were here and in the time since you've left, to bring your best every day for the betterment of our programs. When we finish here, nine new names will go out on that display out in the front lobby. I see every day coaches bringing recruits through. And when coaches bring those recruits through, they always stop there and they tell the stories of the names on that display. And what happens in that moment is that you see a spark in a recruit's eye because all of a sudden what's possible for them here at Hopkins becomes tangible and becomes real. I love when we're able to tell those stories. I love that we're gonna hear some more of those stories tonight. And I just wanna reiterate again, we are today because of who you were. And I really hope that together we can continue to celebrate a very bright future for all Blue Jays to come. Thanks so much, enjoy the show. Thank you, Jen. Before we move on to the induction portion of this evening's festivities, Jen mentioned that we have a number of Hall of Famers, people already in the Athletic Hall of Fame that are with us tonight. And at this time, as is customary, we would like to take a moment to recognize each of them. So when I say your name, if you could please stand to be recognized. And I am humbled by how many of you have made it back here this evening. First, John Blank. <laughs> Jeremy Brown. And there's a complete list in your program of all the members of the Athletic Hall of Fame, but these are the people that are with us tonight. Joe Cowan. 
<laughs> Del Dressel. <laughs> Jamie Fleetwood. <laughs> Alice Margraf. <laughs> Brian Pacola. <laughs> Dave Petromala. Larry Quinn, Terry Reardon, Yanni Rosenberg, Bob Babb, Scott Armstrong, Mike Leonhart. Heidi Pierce and Craig Brooks. Thank you all for making it a point to get back here and share in this night with our most recent inductees. So as I mentioned, I would talk a little bit about the format of tonight's evening. Uh, we're not going to stand here, hopefully, and have a long, drawn-out evening where I read the bio of all nine people who are being inducted and the two Distinguished Service Award recipients. In your program, there's a bio for each of the individuals that is being honored tonight, and that tells you a little bit about what they did at Hopkins, why they were elected, or why they are being honored. Rather, many years ago, when the Hall of Fame started here in Hopkins in 1994, we decided that we would take the opportunity here to tell you about the people that we are honoring. So we reached out to all of our inductees and gathered some photos, and what I'm going to try and do in, in 12, 14, maybe 15 photos is tell you the life story of our nine inductees. And I'll do that with some information I gathered while well, I had somewhere between a 45 minute and a one hour call with each of our inductees in the last two weeks. So as many of you know, Craig Brooks emceed this event for probably, I just talked to Craig, maybe 12 or 15 years uh, before he stepped down and, and I took over this, this role uh, maybe five or six years ago. And Craig, if any of you attended one of these events when Craig was the MC, Craig did a masterful job of mixing humor. It was pretty much all humor when Craig <laughs> MC'd this event. I am not nearly as funny as Craig, so I want to throw that out there now. But some of the photos that were provided will take care of the humor for me. Trust me. So what does a Johns Hopkins Athletic Hall of Famer receive when they are inducted? In addition to the, to the display in the lobby, and I hope you all got to see, we added the names uh, the other day of our nine inductees. They will receive a plaque that they can display in their uh, home or office. They will receive an official Johns Hopkins Athletic Hall of Fame watch. And they will receive a gold plate that entitles them to free admission to any Johns Hopkins athletic event. Now, as most of you know, 99% of our events are free. <laughs> so, for the 1% that you come to a men's lacrosse game where we are charging admission, nine inductees tonight, I need you to listen closely. When you get to the gate, whip out that gold pass and the ticket taker will have no idea what to do when you pull that pass out. And when you start to talk to them about what it means, it's gonna be like you're talking in cursive, okay? He's gonna have, he or she is gonna have no idea. But tell them you're friends with Arthur at the front of the rec center and that will take care of you. So with all of that, now you know what they get. You can read about why they were elected now let's learn a little bit more about our nine inductees. Harvey Allen. Dr. Harvey Allen was born on November 6th, 1961 in Nashville, Tennessee. And yes, if you weren't sure, Harvey is the oldest of our inductees this evening. <laughs> Harvey is the youngest of two children of Harvey and Simona Allen, seen here with older sister Gail, who is also, I believe, with us here celebrating tonight. Harvey's mom, Harvey's mom recently turned 90. She is not here, but I hope she is watching our live stream of tonight's event and enjoying this evening with her son. The family would settle in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where Harvey and Gail would both begin their swimming careers. Harvey and Gail grew up at a time when it wasn't just enough to be brother and sister. No, nope, mom and dad also had to buy them matching swimming outfits when they competed <laughs> as well. Harvey shared with me that when he began swimming in Winston-Salem in the late 1960s, the pools in Winston-Salem were still segregated. Undaunted, 
He would become a highly accomplished swimmer at the AAU level, and he became the first black state swimming champion in North Carolina state history. For good measure, Harvey would go on to win 38 state championships in the state of North Carolina. Harvey attracted the attention of Harvard, Princeton, North Carolina, North Carolina State, among the other schools that were recruiting him, but Johns Hopkins was, as he put it, the easy choice. The combination of academics, specifically in his chosen area of medicine, and athletics were, in his mind, unmatched. He had also grown up swimming with John and Dan Blank, John was two years older and already a member of the Blue Jay swimming team here, the national champion swimming team at the time. And that would, he also would eventually obviously land himself in the Hall of Fame as we heard earlier. Harvey would join his lifelong friends here at Homewood. Harvey would become an accomplished member of the Blue Jay swimming program under the guidance of Tim Welsh. He became a 13-time All-American, six-time national runner-up. And while he was here, the team would take winter recruit uh, winter travel down to florida to train now obviously three weeks in florida not a bad deal from late december to january right you escape the harsh winters of baltimore who wouldn't want to be in florida from late december until early until late january i would say harvey did not want to be in florida <laughs> because he apparently hated florida After graduating from Johns Hopkins, Harvey would go on to graduate from Wake Forest Medical School. He would practice in Winston-Salem for 10 years in internal medicine and gastroenterology. Later, he spent about seven years as the chief of gastroenterology at a VA medical center at another location down in Lumberton, North Carolina. In my conversation with Harvey, it became very obvious how important his family and friends were to him. This is him and his family in his younger days on the beach in every photo he sent me, he always had a great smile. Except for the one in Florida. That one, he was not smiling for that one. Harvey has two sons. Harvey III, in the center of this photo here, is a third year medical student at Duke. Joshua is an electrical engineer at Boeing in Seattle. This is Harvey and Joshua crashing the Thanksgiving Day Parade in New York City a couple of years ago. Today, Harvey lives in Utica, New York, where he is the chief of gastroenterology at St. Luke's and St. Elizabeth Hospital in Utica. He is currently engaged to his fiancee, Julianne Smirka, who is here with us this evening celebrating. Julianne is a psychologist and clinical trials coordinator, and she and Harvey actually met more than 20 years ago in California and reconnected about eight years ago, and they will be married in the near future. So I was going to end my talk about Harvey with this professional photo, but Harvey, if you haven't talked to him, is really enjoying his weekend here at Hopkins. And earlier, our crack photography staff caught him reliving his youth on the block down in the uh, pool. So that was taken about eight hours ago, right over on the other side of the wall. Ladies and gentlemen, for induction into the Johns Hopkins Athletic Hall of Fame, Dr. Harvey Allen. Good evening. I would like to thank our host Johns Hopkins University for this honor and everyone for coming out tonight. Due to a miscommunication, I almost missed this event. I'm a gastroenterologist in a very busy practice. We take hundreds of calls per day. My nurse came to me and said that Mr. Hopkins keeps calling. For four, for four weeks, but he would not give his date of birth. So I said, well, uh, so they wouldn't put the call through to me. I instructed my nurse to get his first name and he might be in our old database. 
they got back to me in about two weeks, and she came back and said, Mr. Hopkins still keeps calling. Uh, I didn't get his date of birth, but I got his first name. And I said, well, what's, what's Mr. Hopkins' name? He goes, Mr. Johns Hopkins. And I was like, oh, my God, please put the call through. I wanted to tell you a story of how things have changed for me from 1960 to now. I grew up in the South in North Carolina. I grew up in the segregated South. Black and white societies were completely separated. There were black and white water fountains. We went black and white schools and hospitals. Then we separated through buses, churches, houses, everything. This was the law of the land for a hundred years for millions of Americans. It was even a state crime for interracial marriage in North Carolina. We had separate parks, golf courses, tennis courts, and separate swimming pools. The two societies rarely interacted. Going over to the other side of town was met with stress and peril sometimes. My aunt, Melanie, who Bert Peterson knows very well, wanted to eat at a lunch counter and she sat at the wrong place. And police drug her out and knocked her unconscious and cracked her skull. You know, fortunately, the Supreme Court ruled segregation was unfair and illegal. And I was a direct beneficiary and I was allowed to swim at any pool at that, you know, and it was a change. I was only allowed to swim at the African American pool before that. I joined the AAU and the YMCA, and, um, and I began, uh, you know, my swimming career. At, at the very beginning, there were difficulties. Um, you know, John and uh, Dan Blank were my best friends throughout the years. Um, and I flourished uh, through my elementary and high school careers. However, societies were still completely separated. When I came to Hopkins, this was completely different experience. I was welcomed with open arms. There was fairness and equity, even outside the athletic department. No matter what your race, religion, orientation, we were all together. We lived together. We worked together. We played together. We studied together. We even dined together. It was definitely a life-changing experience. Again, I would like to thank Johns Hopkins University, and I challenge you to continue to support this institution because definitely for me, Hopkins is a beacon of equality. Hopkins is a beacon for fairness. Hopkins is a beacon for educational excellence and certainly gives me hope for the future. Thank you. Carrie Cathcart was born on July 8, 1975, in Fairbanks, Alaska. <laughs> Carrie is the younger of two children, to Wallace and Kay Cathcart, who are both with us here this evening. Carrie is two years younger than older sister Kim. If I hadn't mentioned when Carrie was born, Kim's outfit here certainly has 1970s written all over it. <laughs> Carrie was an active youngster in Alaska. She played basketball, was a figure skater and would start playing soccer at age seven. One of her other big passions was BMX racing, which was popular in Alaska, and she did that in the summer, mostly in the Anchorage area. 
While Alaska is great for the outdoors in the summer, you know, those six weeks in July and August, the family would also enjoy trips to Carrie's grandparents in Hawaii where they would trade the bears of Alaska for the parrots of Hawaii. In addition to the trips to Hawaii, the Cathcarts would make annual trips to Colorado and Utah to go skiing because there's not enough snow in Alaska to ski, you need to go somewhere else. Yep, Carrie was just a normal kid from Alaska doing what all the other girls did, camping, camping skiing, and of course, halibut fishing. <laughs> Carrie considered some outstanding institutions for college, among them Harvard, MIT, Vanderbilt, and Navy. Small soccer and to study engineering. She joined the one year soccer program at Coach Lee's won just two games in Carrie's freshman year. But she and Mara Liberman showed here with Coach Lyle, a freshman from 1996, helped the Blue Jays win their first Centennial Conference championship in the fifth year of the program's history. In short, they laid the foundation of the program that we enjoy today. Pictured here with some of her sorority sisters, Carrie graduated from Johns Hopkins with a degree in chemical engineering, and this is where the story really gets cool. She went on to master's degrees in forensic science and criminal science at University and later graduated from the police academy in West Virginia. Read this because some of it is so elaborate. I, I want to make sure I get it. Terry worked for the state of Alaska Crime Lab as a latent print examiner investigator and is now the Forensic and Biometric Agency. At one point, she spent four months Missile, missile strike. Among her tasks at Bagram, she would analyze IEDs, bombs, and other materials that were gathered for forensic evidence to track to specific terrorists. And remains very active. On one deployment in Egypt, she was the pyramids. She was back to Alaska to visit her sister there. Just a little snow on the ground, says so probably early June. She still enjoys hiking. She's also an avid runner and will compete in her next marathon in the Twin Cities in about two weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, for induction into the Johns Hopkins Athletic Hall of Fame, Carrie Cathcart. For the introduction. I'm sure many of you think of Alaska as a place to cruise, see majestic mountains, lots of moose and bear, and maybe the northern lights. Not necessarily a place to grow up and play soccer. In high school, our season usually started in March or whenever the snow melted. We played outside for about five months out of the year if we were lucky, but that didn't stop me from falling in love with the sport. People even today kept asking me why I came all the way to Hopkins from Alaska, and the answer is pretty easy. My parents said I had to leave the state. <laughs> so I wanted a small school, an engineering program, and I wanted to play, and Hopkins met all those requirements. Uh, when I came to Hopkins, as Ernie stated, the program was in its second year being a varsity sport. Uh, we got annihilated by virtually every single team and we won two games out of the 12 games that we played. And by our senior year, the growth and level of play was exponential, the recruiting was amazing, and it elevated us to the conference championship. I can't thank Coach Weil enough for the opportunity to play for Hopkins. All he had were my achievements on paper and a tape that my dad had compiled of me playing. Uh, recruiting wasn't necessarily a thing in Alaska, 
uh, especially coming all the way from the East Coast. So I'm grateful that Coach Weil believed in me and my ability. Uh, however, I would not be here if it wasn't for my family. When I was little, I wanted to do everything my sister was doing. The feeling probably wasn't mutual, uh, but she tolerated me nonetheless. I followed in her footsteps figure skating, but that didn't last long. I quickly learned I did not have the grace nor the flexibility to be a figure skater. However, I would not have gotten into athletics if it wasn't for her lead, and I wanted to be able to keep up with her. So my competitiveness for sports and pretty much everything else was learned early on and continues to the annoyance of others to this day. I can't remember a race, game, or event that my parents did not attend. My dad started a business when I was very young. He worked, he was gone from the house at 6.30 every morning and worked every Saturday for as long as I can remember. But still, he was there every game to cheer me on. My mom was the ultimate team mom. She was always volunteering to drive her Suburban loaded with teammates to tournaments every summer on the one of two roads that led out of Anchorage. She did all of this while also working full time. I feel very fortunate uh, that both of them are here with me this weekend. Their support and encouragement continues to this day. Uh, finally, I'd like to fr uh, thank my friend Larry Better for the nominating me. I would also like to thank the Hall of Fame committee for thinking that that was a good idea. <laughs> I would especially like to recognize her better as I recently found out just yesterday he was responsible for making the women's soccer team a varsity sport. Thank you again, and congratulations to all the honorees. Go hop. Eric Fischel was born on June 30th, 1986, right here in Baltimore at Sinai Hospital. I'm not sure why, but every time we do something where I, we involve a wrestler and I need photos, they always send me one of them eating. It's like they need to prove that they actually eat. Eric is the youngest of, three, of the three sons of Larry and Nancy Fischel, who are both with us here this evening. Three years separate each of the three Fischel boys, with oldest brother Matt and middle brother Robert arriving before Eric. Eric and his brothers were very into sports at a young age. Wrestling was actually the last sport that Eric began to play. He started playing lacrosse when he was four, football when he was six, and didn't start wrestling until he was seven. Like his older brothers, he had actually played basketball prior to that, but it was indicated to the officials that maybe Eric was a little rough for basketball, so he started to wrestle. Now, if you think back, he played basketball, and they told him that he was a little bit too rough, which, of course, is exactly what you would think of the kid who shows up in a long sleeve green polo shirt to play basketball. <laughs> in addition to his love of sports, he was also a Boy Scout and loved nature. As he noted to me when we spoke last week, his mom and brothers enjoyed nature to a normal extent. Eric took it to another level and was particularly fascinated by birds. Now, Larry and Nancy enjoyed traveling <clears throat> around the world and wanted to ex uh, expose their children to different cultures. Family trips included trips to treks to Hawaii, Europe, and Kenya, where Eric's love of birds is on display right here. Now, wrestling, if you've never done it, is the most demanding sport that there is. There are no timeouts. There are no subs. It's just you and your opponent. You need to rely on strength, coordination, sorry, strength, conditioning, training, and the coordination that Eric obviously is displaying. People send me photos for this, and I have no idea why, and this is one of those photos. <clears throat> Eric was a three four standard by Owings Mills High School and was the Owings Mills Times Athlete of the Year as a senior as he excelled in football, wrestling, and lacrosse. Eric was recruited to Johns Hopkins by former coach Kirk Salvo and wrestled one year for him and three years for current head coach Keith Norris. Eric would go on to become the most accomplished wrestler in school history at the time, setting a school record for wins, winning two conference championships, and becoming the first All-American in Johns Hopkins wrestling history.
Eric earned his master's degree in natural resource from the U University of Missouri and spent 11 years studying bird ecology and conservation around the world. He later started Baltimore Food Parks, which is now Running Birds of Urban Baltimore. Eric's career as an ornithologist has taken him to seven countries, including Peru, Mexico, Malaysia, and Australia, just to name a couple. This cool shot right here was taken at the top of the tallest mountain in Southeast Asia, Mount Kinabalu, which has an elevation of over 13,400 feet. On this particular trip, Eric was working about halfway up the mountain, and they were able to make their way up to the top. He was there studying the effect of elevation on different bird species. On that same mountain, he's pictured here. He's the one on the, on the right, okay? <laughs> With a white head's broad bill, that mountain is the only place in the world where that bird can be found. This next shot of Eric was taken in the Peruvian Amazon. He's pictured here with a broad-billed mot mot. I'm hoping I'm getting this right. I, I wrote it down like he told me to. But he's obviously seen some amazing species of birds during his career. Now I spend anywhere again from 40, 40 minutes to maybe an hour with each of our uh, inductees on a call trying to find out what I can use in this talk to tell you a little bit more about them. And I'm always fascinated by the experiences they share of their time, not when they were here, but after they've left Hopkins. Eric grew up less than 15 miles from Johns Hopkins, but Johns Hopkins has taken him around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, for induction into the Johns Hopkins Athletic Hall of Fame, Eric Fischel. to thank everybody who's here who made this possible who allowed me to be up here today and for inviting me to be part of the Johns Hopkins Hall of Fame so I'm gonna start this off by telling you all what it means to me to be a Blue Jay now as a bird biologist there is a lot of ways <laughs> I could approach this but uh, instead I think I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about my time at Hopkins and my experience with the wrestling program both as a athlete and as a coach so my experience at Hopkins, both in the academic side of things and on the athletic side of things, really showed me all the work and perseverance it takes to be successful in just about anything you put your mind to. And as you can see, I've been to some pretty wild places over the years, and some of those places we are spending in 90 degree heat 12 hours a day, super, super humid, can't eat the whole day, and all I'm thinking the whole time is, oh, wrestling practice is harder than this. <laughs> Um, and all of this while I am doing that, I'm also collecting really important scientific data. So it's important that while I am um, struggling with these really, really hard things, um, I am able to accurately and, um, and diligently collect this information. And both the academics and the athletic parts of Hopkins really helped me understand all of the hard work that it takes to make sure that those things go well. Um, my experience at Hopkins also opened me up to a whole variety of different individuals um, and different experiences that allowed me to not only be successful in the work that I've been doing around the world, but also in um, my relationships that I have built. Um, another really great thing that I've learned from my experience at Hopkins is really what it means to build community, which is why I ended up coming back to Baltimore back in 2018, I believe, to start my nonprofit, which uh, used to be called Baltimore Food Parks and now is called Birds of Urban Baltimore, which works with um, underserved communities all around Baltimore to um, help give them opportunities to experience environmental education and conservation careers. Um, but all of those things are to say that Hopkins really prepared me to go on the right path to be successful anywhere in the entire world. Um, but one thing I do want to make sure that we talk about today is my experience with the Hopkins wrestling program. So as you all heard, I had a really great experience as an athlete. Um, we had lots and lots of really fun times, including trips to Florida. Um, my parents accompanied me to several trips to uh, the great state of Iowa to go and watch me wrestle. Um, but really where I felt more of a connection with the Hopkins wrestling program is as a coach. Um, in between my trips to all these different jungles, I came back to, to Baltimore, and every single time I came back and coached Hopkins for about a month or two when I could before I went on my next trip. And one of the favorite things to see, um, as you heard, I was the first 
Johns Hopkins All-American. Um, I was the first two-time conference champion. I had the most wins at Hopkins at the time. All of those records have been surpassed. We've had three-time All-Americans. We've had people in the national finals. We've had multiple All-Americans. We've had four-time conference champions. And it's really amazing to see the program grow as we build it and as Coach Norris back there builds it. Um, just making sure we're bringing in really, really great students. We also had the highest GPA in the country for any school two years ago, and I think we were in the top five again this year. So not only are we excelling on the map, but we're also excelling academically. Um, so I do just want to say that it's really exciting to not only be included in the Johns Hopkins Hall of Fame, but I'm extra excited to see all the wrestlers that are going to be coming up on the stage after me becoming part of the Johns Hopkins Hall of Fame. Thank you all so much. So by now you've figured out we're going in alphabetical order, which means you know who's next. Lacey Lee Hentz was born on June 16, 1983 in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to Larry and Pat Hentz, and it didn't take long for a free-spirited Lacey to make her mark on the family. Translation, if you know, you know. Lacey was the third of three girls for Larry and Pat with older sisters Anna and Kellen. While mom encouraged the girls to be well-rounded and pushed experiences other than sports, Lacey, as those who know may be surprised to hear, liked being on the move all the time and loved the rush that came with playing sport and the physical nature of sport. Now, as someone who watched almost all of her games during her four-year career here at Hopkins, I found this to be shocking. The girls kept mom and dad busy for sure. As you can tell, they were well adjusted. No prankster in any of the hence girls there at all. The family logged many miles each summer on an annual 10-day trip. It would include many trips to national parks. And dad in particular loved what Lacey referred to as the local experiences, not just the touristy things. Lacey was a highly regarded recruit and her final three schools of choice were Georgetown, Loyola, and Johns Hopkins all relatively close to her home in Carroll County, all good schools. I asked Lacey if she had a picture of herself playing in high school or club or something like that that I could use in this spot, and she said, nope, I was recruited out of middle school. So this is a middle school shot, I assume. Now, in addition to sending the, this photo, when she sent this, she also sent me a couple of certificates that she received. You know the ones you get in elementary school? You know, outstanding band performer, great artist. Both of hers were for class clown. This photo is from a bit later, but Lacey remembers Johns Hopkins women's lacrosse coach Janine Tucker coming to her house on her recruiting visit for dinner the night after the coach at Loyola had done the same thing. Loyola at Georgetown had already been eliminated from Lacey's list by now, and it was down to Hopkins and Loyola. When Coach Tucker left, her parents encouraged her to look at the big picture. And this is a quote she said that they said to her. She said she remembers them saying, there are many Loyolas, there's one Johns Hopkins. Lacey would arrive at Hopkins and become the All-American shutdown defender head coach Janine Tucker needed as she continued to build the Blue Jays at the Division I level. Lacey helped put the Blue Jays on the Division I map, and she guided the team to help guide the team to its first two trips to the NCAA tournament at the Division I level in 2004 and 2005. I do want to be clear, this picture here, there may have been a few yellow cards in Lacey's career. I don't think she got one on this particular play, but it's possible. Pictured here with another of Hopkins' all-time greats, Erin Wellner, Lacey went on to get her master's in school counseling from the Johns Hopkins School of Education in 2011, and she's currently a high school counselor at Francis Scott Key High School. In 2012, Lacey married Kyle Headley, whom she had met when she was a senior here at Hopkins. Lacey and Kyle are the proud parents of a son and a daughter. Emery will be nine in December. Ethan will turn seven next week. I have no idea where they get their personality from, but if I had to guess, it's Lacey. Other than tracking the kids to all of their events, Lacey describes their life as simple and enjoyable and finds it ironic that she's never, never taken life seriously 
and yet she's a school counselor. Ladies and gentlemen, for induction into the Johns Hopkins Athletic Hall of Fame, I present Lacey Lee Hence Headley. There's nothing like feeling old when they blind you and then they make you read in front of a bunch of people that are looking at you. So bear with me here. Um, good evening and congratulations to all of the inductees and the honorees tonight. It's crazy to think that 20 years ago, I was a student on campus here, which makes me seem really freaking old. All right, and also if you have children, I'm sorry if I cuss. I'm gonna, I told Coach Tucker I was gonna be on good behavior tonight, but there was an open bar, so it's all off. Okay. <laughs> So for nearly 20 years, I had had this reoccurring dream that I got a phone call that I didn't actually graduate from Hopkins. And I'm not sure if any of the other athletes felt this way, but I think it was the 4.30 a.m. like wake up call when you had to be up at the athletic center before the crack of dawn and you were um, being screamed at by our behemoth uh, strength and conditioning coach, Curtis, if you know, you know. Um, so, but turns out I graduated and then they let me in again to my master's program. So I think there's something wrong with the admissions process, um, but here I am. Um, I'm humbled and honored to be recognized as a member of the class of 2020, two years later, um, Hopkins Hall of Fame. I'm forever indebted to the sport of lacrosse for the amazing opportunities that it provided me, introducing me to a host of inspiring people and the awesome challenge of learning many life lessons um, while having fun and being part of something much bigger than myself. I was fortunate enough to catch and throw well enough uh, to land me a spot at one of the most prestigious universities in the world. And I'm thankful um, that JHU for challenging me um, and forcing me outside of my comfort zone. And I'm proud to be part of something uh, much bigger than myself and part of the Blue Jay family. Um, Hopkins is a pressure cooker environment and we all survived relatively unscathed and thankfully before any of this was documented on social media. <laughs> So it turns out I could get a job in public education, because if that was the case now, I'm not sure I could. Um, but we all graduated as better humans. It wasn't always pretty, and there were many times where I wanted to take the easier path. But my parents kicked me out of the car um, at Woolman and into the big loving arms of Big Mama, the security guard, and ultimately turned me over to my college mom, Coach Tucker. I'm thankful to have the opportunity to publicly apologize to Coach Tucker for having to endure four years of my ridiculousness. And it speaks to her character that she still wants to talk to me. Um, I remember her relentlessly trying to rein my intensity and helping me to adjust my approach and to focus on leadership um, rather than outcomes. And I didn't understand it back then, but I realize now that there is a positive, positive correlation between leadership and outcomes. And suddenly the Statistics 115 teacher makes sense to me, that positive correlation, then I begged him to pass me, um, but here I am. <laughs> and they let me in again twice, just letting me know. All right. But not only did Coach Tucker talk about positive leadership, she lived it. She was the perfect example for young women and how to lead confidently, face hardship head on. Um, and here, see, this is where you're reading as an old person. Um, she was a perfect example for young women on how to lead confidently, Face hardship head on and demonstrate your character and leadership should impact way more than the first ring of your circle of close people. This has continued in my life after college and I'm grateful to have learned these important lessons even if it took several early morning practices and hellish sprints to beat it into my head. My teammates deserve recognition as well. They allowed me to develop leadership skills on a trial and error basis. There were many more errors than, than anything else and they managed to laugh at my jokes still, even when I was impersonating them on the bus or during pregame warmups. My teammates allowed me to be successful statistically, but also taught me invaluable lessons in working together to achieve a common goal. I should also probably publicly apologize to them as well for enduring my craziness on the field, but also after a few beverages at PJ's where the real intensity came out. But my parents had a lot to do with my decision to come to Hopkins. When I narrowed it to my list, it came down to two schools, as Ernie was talking about before, separated in less than two miles. My parents reminded me of the opportunity to go to a world-renowned university, which led me ultimately all the way to a career in public education. My parents knew it would be a change of scenery for my relatively rural roots, but saw my potential well before I could. 
They spent years carting us to and from practices and tournaments. They sacrificed time and energy so that I could play sports with perfect combination of tough love and, and compassion. Those car rides strategizing before national tryouts or after a tough game are where I learned some of the best lessons. And despite my sour, too cool for school, teenage attitude and sassy eye rolls, I was listening. And my confession tonight is not only was I listening, but now I'm hoping to become my parents. <laughs> my parents taught me how to relish the underdog role and to play with confidence. My parents taught me to crave playing against the toughest opponents and to constantly strive for more. And my parents also taught me the value of family. My little family, my husband Kyle, my daughter Emery, and my son Ethan are my greatest accomplishments. They didn't know me back then, thank God, <laughs> but I spent four years preparing for them so that I could be the best wife and the best mom. My years at Hopkins taught me how to be strong, how to be vulnerable, despite what I like to think, <laughs> how to be confident, and how to ask others for help. I am forever indebted to this university, this lacrosse program, my coaches, my teammates, and my family. And thank you to the wonderful Blue Jay family um, for putting on such a great event. I know that um, you know, we all don't take ourselves too seriously, but this really is a great opportunity to thank everything um, and everybody that goes into everybody that comes up here tonight. So thank you so much. Gary Kane Jr. was born November 11, 1982 in the great city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Go Eagles! Gary is the second oldest of Gary and Joanne Kane's six, or eight children. In order from oldest to youngest, they are Kristen, Gary, Kelly, Tori, Jojo, Jack, Kyle, and Carly. Now when I asked Gary for all of their names, he read them off like that. I felt like I was watching Goodwill Hunting, where he reads off the name of his eight brothers. Gary was spot on when he read off the names to me. Gary grew up playing sports, and with a physique like this, you can see why he would excel. <laughs> when he wasn't flexing and showing off a build that only a mother could love, Gary was showing off the coordination and sharp dressing skills that would serve him well later on the pitch. When Gary wasn't representing Philly in his replica Randall Cunningham jersey, he was playing every sport he could including baseball, basketball, and especially soccer, where he was quickly developing as a great goalie with a requisite flashy goalie-keeping goalie kit and adorning bowl haircut that were very popular in the, uh, early, in the late 80s and early 90s in the Philly area. One thing that was obvious to me in my conversation with Gary was how important his family was then and is to him now. Gary was the only one of the eight kids who would go on to play sports in college, but he remembers taking trips during the summer, not just to his own soccer tournaments, but road trips to all the other kids' uh, events as well. And, and particularly, one of his sisters was a great basketball player. They went out to, I believe it was Oklahoma City, uh, for the national championships out there. And it was a family affair, those events. I mentioned that Gary is the second oldest of eight children. I believe there's a 22-year gap between the oldest and the youngest of the Kane kids. Gary shared some really cool stories about growing up as one of eight kids, but there was one that really was pretty remarkable, and I just want to share it real quick. You know, when you're, when you're one of eight, some of the older ones become almost like parents or uncles or aunts because there's such an age gap. When Gary was 17, the seventh of the eight kids, younger brother Kyle, was born. Nothing strange about that, except Kyle... Kyle came along, Gary was at back to school night with his mom when she went into labor, and 17-year-old Gary drove his mom to the hospital so she could give birth to his youngest brother. <laughs> Gary decided that he would attend Johns Hopkins and play for head coach Matt Smith, who had, since had, who had been at Hopkins and had turned us into a national power in men's soccer. Gary could have gone to a number of Division I schools, and he noted maybe played by the time he was a junior or a senior. But he came to Hopkins, stepped on the field as a freshman, and never left the net. Now, you can read about his accomplishments in your program, as I noted earlier. We're not going to read his bio, but I would like to point out 2004. Now, I've been here for 25 years, and I've seen some truly amazing 
seasons by so many Johns Hopkins student athletes. And if I had to rank them, I don't know what would be one, but Gary's 2004 season would certainly be in the conversation. That year we went 17, one and two. We were ranked number two in the nation. But I'm telling you right now, we could not score a goal. We just could not score. And I remember as that season progressed, we weren't losing games, but I remember thinking, if we give up a goal, we can't win. Not that we couldn't tie, we could get to one. I didn't think we could get to two. So we played 20 games that year. Gary started all 20, he gave up five goals in 20 games. In the conference semifinals, right here at Homewood Field, the game went to penalty kicks. It was 0-0, of course. And then we shut them out in penalty kicks. That doesn't happen. We didn't give up a penalty kick goal that night uh, against Muhlenberg, if I remember correctly. Gary graduated from Johns Hopkins in 2005 and has worked at Deutsche Bank in New York for the last 17 years. It was there that he met a fellow intern named Rachel, and in 2012, they were married. Rachel herself worked on Wall Street for about 10 years, and she and Gary are now the proud parents of Sophia, age six, and Gary the third, age four. Sophia just started first grade, and Gary described her as a smart, engaging six-year-old. Younger brother Gary, well, dad described him as someone who pushes Sophia to her limit and is all boy. <laughs> Gary and Rachel spend as much time as possible with their family, their extended families. And like many, they've struggled over the last two years during the pandemic to find the time where they could all get together. And as you can see, when they get together, the photographer has to back up and zoom out because there's always a lot of people there. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present Gary Kane Jr. induction into the Johns Hopkins Athletic Hall of Fame. I'm humbled and honored to be here this evening. I'd like to start by acknowledging my fellow inductees. It's a special moment to be up here with such an esteemed group of student athletes. I'd like to thank Johns Hopkins University, the athletic department, and the men's soccer program. Some of the best years of my life were spent at Homewood campus and on Homewood field. I'd be remiss not to mention a few folks who were impactful to my development as a soccer player. Rick and Bill Bond, Bob Peffel, Coach Smith, who gave me a chance to prove myself as a skinny, undersized freshman, as the photo showed, and my teammates. Uh, Ernie was kind enough to list some of the stats from 2004, uh, but it was the 10 guys that stood in front of me that actually did most of the work that year. In particular, I'd like to call out Ryan Kitson, Jeff Grosser, Adam Hack, Nick Challen, Chris Brown and Trevor Davis. When I thought about my speech tonight, I thought about sharing stories of my time at Hopkins, recounting big games, and talking about all the hard work and dedication that got me to this moment. But it just didn't feel right. What felt right was using the public forum of this evening to thank my support group, my family. Rachel, Sophia, Gary, you guys are my world today. While you weren't around while I was playing soccer at Hopkins, you mean everything to me. I love you guys. Thank you for being here to celebrate with Dad. As Ernie said, the King Group is huge and we travel in a pack. That pack is led by my mom. She's the most selfless woman I've ever met. Tonight is the perfect example of her selflessness. It's her birthday. But instead of celebrating her, she insisted that everybody travel down to Baltimore to allow me to relive athletic accomplishments of two decades ago. We are so lucky to have you, Mom. Thank you for being the rock to everybody in the family. I love you, and happy birthday. I'm one of eight, but that eight's now 12, given all the spouses that have entered the family, and hopefully one day it'll be 16. We're all best friends. We support each other 
in the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. But we always do it together. I love you guys. Thank you for always being with me and supporting me. There's one special acknowledgement that needs to happen tonight. In my mind, the man that actually deserves to be honored tonight is the man that made me into who I am today. The man that taught me what hard work is, the one that taught me not to settle, to not make excuses, to not accept limitations, and to go out and actually earn my goals. The one that was at every game and every practice. The man that even needed to learn a new sport when I couldn't cut it at baseball or basketball. The guy that would talk strategy before games for hours and analyze my play in painstaking detail after games. The man that never once told me the sacrifices that he made to be there. And he only missed one game in my entire college career. This man is my dad. I thought, how am I gonna describe what my dad means to me? And I came up with this short anecdote. In that senior year that Ernie talked about, we lost at Salisbury in the round of 16 in the NCAA tournament. One nothing, of course. Other than that loss, it was a storybook season. I held my head high as I walked off the field knowing that we really left it all out there in that game in that year. We broke huddle, we walked over to thank our fans and I got to my dad and I broke down in tears. He gave me a big hug. He told me that I played great. I had nothing to be upset about. It was a great career and that he was proud of me. When I was finally able to collect myself, I took a step back and I said I wasn't sad about the outcome of that day, but it was the first time in my life that I realized that it wasn't about me, it was always about us. You were by my side every step of the way. This induction tonight is not mine, it's ours. I will always look at this in my career as our accomplishments, not my own. Thank you for everything you do for me, Dad. I love you. So through the years of being on the Athletic Hall of Fame committee, I receive all the nominations that, that we get. And, and we've received some, some great nominations, but we often get uh, nominations sent in for people who have obviously made outstanding contributions to the Department of Athletics and Recreation, but who may not necessarily you know, fit the criteria for a Hall of Famer. And several years ago, our committee decided that we would establish an award for distinguished service that we could award at the annual uh, or every other year uh, Athletic Hall of Fame induction ceremony. And we just established two main criteria for that award. The first, just an outstanding contribution and or service to the Department of Athletics and Recreation. We wanted to be as vague as possible to leave the door open to as many individuals as we could. The contributions of service should be documented over a length of period, not less than 10 years. Two inductees or two honorees tonight, or three honorees tonight, certainly have gone above the 10 year threshold. And as some of you know, Ralph O'Connor uh, was the first uh, recipient of this award when we presented it back in 2018 for the first time. Tonight, we are thrilled to add two individual, two people, two recipients, three people to that list. The first is Neil Grauer. And when you think. <clears throat> When you think of the history of the Johns Hopkins athletic program, an argument can be made that no single individual other than Bob Scott, who's pictured here with Neil, has had a touch point with more Blue Jay student athletes than Neil Grauer. He never coached a game, didn't officially recruit anybody to Johns Hopkins, never impacted the final outcome of any athletic event in any sport. Yet in the five plus decades since his arrival as a student at Johns Hopkins in 1966, his NAGJ logo has been the constant in the department. 
His presence and support have been there each and every step of the way as well. Virtually every member of the men's lacrosse team during that time has had an individual caricature of himself made, crafted by Neil using his Nag J Blue Jay. The Nag J served as our official logo for several decades, and even now since we've moved to a university developed mark, the Nag J is still extremely pop popular and used by all of our 24 athletic teams in some way. Coaches, student athletes, administrators, we come and go. And through the years, many people have served in this department and many, many more people will serve as we move forward. The Nag J arrived at Homewood more than 50 years ago and it's not going anywhere. We have Neil Grower to thank for a contribution that will outlast all of us here at Homewood. The Nag J is not just a logo, it bonds generations past, present, and future of Hopkins student athletes. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure, pleasure that I present Neil Grower for the Johns Hopkins Award for Distinguished Service. Many thanks, Ernie, for that extremely kind introduction. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Ernie, for that extremely kind introduction. It is an immense honor for me to receive this award from Hopkins Athletics, particularly as it comes along with the induction into the Hall of Fame of such celebrated athletes, including two of the most distinguished lacrosse luminaries ever to grace Homewood Field, Dave Marr and my close friend, Paul Rabel. Uh, just to be associated with them in this way is for me extraordinary. I've been given this honor because so many illustrious leaders of Hopkins sports took a liking to my con cartoon version of the Blue Jay and have made that little guy an enduring emblem of Hopkins athletics for more than half a century. I've been instructed uh, to keep my remarks brief, <laughs> something that is not in my nature. <laughs> but I think I can do so simply by listing those to whom I really owe this honor beginning with the late, legendary Bob Scott, whose statue, I, whose statue I pat every time I pass it. The late, beloved Fred Smith. The late, incomparable Henry Ciccaroni. The late Jerome Schneidman, Joe Cowan, Dennis Townsend, Jerry Pfeiffer, Don Zimmerman, Tony Seaman, John Hawes, the one and only Dave Petromala, <laughs> Seth Tierney, Bill Dwan, Bobby Benson, Pete Milliman, Jameson Kesterer, John Crawley, and Brian Kelly. Also, all of those coaches who have led Hopkins football, baseball, basketball, swimming, tennis, and fencing over the past 50 years and have put what they now call the Nag J on their athletics year. The late great football coach Jim Margraff. The football coach Greg Camara. Swimming coach Frank Comfort. Swimming coach Scott Armstrong. Bob Babb who has been Hopkins baseball coach so long that many of his players believe he was Babe Ruth's bat boy. <laughs> uh, basketball coach Josh Loeffler, tennis coaches Brendan Kincaid and Dan Pollock, and fencing coach Austin Young. 
My thanks also goes to all of those lacrosse players who have gotten Nag Blue Jay tattoos. Uh, you gentlemen in attendance uh, know who you are. And after this event concludes, you can assemble in the men's room for a display and we can charge admission. Now, I was just going to, I'm going to add a little here a little bit. I was asked uh, to keep this brief, but other people have talked about their experiences and careers at Hopkins. I want you to know how I got into Johns Hopkins. They now no longer give any preference to legacy students. But my grandfather went to Hopkins, class of 1907. My father, class of 1936. I applied for early decision, came here for an interview in 1964. And I was interviewed by a recent graduate, class of 62, I think, who shall remain nameless. And uh, I had an interview at Schreiber Hall. And I uh, tried to be charming, and I tried to be witty, and he sat there stone-faced. Five years later, when I was working, doing work in the admissions office with Ozzie Cowan, I had access to the uh, interview files. <laughs> and of course, I read mine. <laughs> and this gentleman had written, the kid is articulate enough, but he's weird. And he changed his pen from blue to red to write weird in capital red letters. <laughs> and then he wrote, but his father and grandfather went here, so I guess we'll have to take him. <laughs> I wish that son of a bitch was here tonight. And now that I have given my speech, I can celebrate. Thank you very much. Neil Grauer. <laughs> Irv and Kathy Latovsky. I'm sorry you have to go after Neil. <laughs> <laughs> Irv and Kathy Latovsky, the second of our Distinguished Service Award recipients tonight, is the husband and wife tandem of Irv and Kathy Latovsky. If Neil Grower's award tonight is based largely on the visual, Irv and Kathy's is based on the audible. For those of you who may not know, the Johns Hopkins pep band dates back more than 100 years. For more than half of that time, the constant has been Irv Latovsky, who joined the band when he arrived at Homewood in the fall of 1969. Wife Kathy joined him about seven years later, and they've been fixtures there together ever since, and even the kids joined in at times to help mom and dad as part of the band. They've become friends and mentors to literally hundreds of Johns Hopkins students who joined the band as undergraduates and then moved on after four years. They've traveled to hundreds of Blue Jay men's lacrosse and football games, supported the teams through good and bad, braved the elements, the band that every opposing men's lacrosse team in the country hates is beloved by its Blue Jays. There are many traditions associated with the Johns Hopkins athletics, but few, if any, predate the Hopkins pep band, whose two longest standing and proudest members are rightfully honored tonight. It's a great honor, and they're here in 2007. The 2017 gave them a, the 2007 men's lacrosse team gave them a piece of the national championship net when we won the title down at M&T Bank Stadium. It's a great honor to present the Johns Hopkins Department of Athletics Distinguished Service Award to Irv and Kathy Latovsky.
Sorry, this, this is the plate I showed again for free, right? <laughs> it's in here somewhere. I was wondering what the odds are of two forensic scientists being honored at the same ceremony. <laughs> Well, obviously not, because it because it happens, so it's, it's at least possible. Right. <laughs> or ra raise the speaker. <laughs> Thank you. I say the study habits I acquired in college still serve me well today, because I've had two and a half years to prepare this, and I started working on them late last night. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> anyway, but it's been a long journey. I started here, as, as Ernie said, in the fall of uh, 1969. I was a 17-year-old freshman. And I remember walking into the ROTC building and uh, for my first band rehearsal, I was greeted at the door by Conrad Gebelein, the founder of the band, um, who a very, a very distinguished gentleman, white-haired at the time, always wore a suit, and told us to call him Gebby. And to me, as a 17-year-old, that seems like very disrespectful. I couldn't imagine calling someone that, that much my senior you know, by a nickname. But uh, now I'm getting close to the age Gebby was at the time and uh, still in the band, and I say now I wouldn't want the current students treating me like an adult. So, you know, the past 53 years every Saturday, or on Saturdays at Homewood Field, I get to be that 17-year-old again, at least for a few hours. Uh, but with the band, I was able to attend football, all football and lacrosse games, home and away. Uh, initially, we also went to all home basketball games. Uh, but that latter tradition changed uh, about halfway through my freshman year. Uh, that was the year Hopkins hired its first dedicated basketball coach, a guy named what was it, uh, Jim Valvano. You may have, may have heard of him. Uh, he didn't stay here very long. Moved on somewhere in North Carolina, I think. <laughs> but anyway, midway through the season, he contacted us and asked us to stop coming to games. Uh, he, he said, and I more or less quote, that we were too annoying. Um, I always thought that was one of the band's you know, better qualities. Uh, but anyway, over the years, I've made many lifelong friends through my association with Hopkins Athletics, even become friends with a few of the referees. I uh, actually worked for one of them. Um, our family presence in the band, we saw some pictures, has grown. Uh, first adding Kathy, then uh, my children, now my grandchildren. And all those years, I've only missed one championship game. That was Kathy's graduation weekend. She, she still feels guilty about that. And, uh, and, and one homecoming, and that was when we were visiting our, our older daughter, who was living in China at the time. Uh, they got but, the mug. <laughs> <laughs> but Chris did get me a mug the next year to... Uh, Keep the, keep the uh, collection going. But uh, we did visit the Great Wall on that day, and I did wear my homecoming gear uh, to the Great Wall, so I got a picture of, you know, dressed up for homecoming on homecoming day, but just uh, a few thousand miles away. Um, but fortunately for me, the NCAA doesn't regulate the band. Uh, that's aside from Section 1, Rule 25 in the lacrosse rule book. You can look it up when you get home. Um, but, so I haven't been limited to four years of eligibility. Um, after I graduated, I kept coming back season after season, year after year, and I'm still enjoying it as much as I did that first day 53 years ago. So thank you for this honor. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to meet some amazing people and to continue to cheer the Jays on with my trumpet. Thank you. Well, my daughter said today that I look like Mary Poppins and my bag of tricks. I do have a few. Can I stand back? No, you're fine. <laughs> I have my Blue Jay songbook with me that I have printed. But first, I want to say that I am both honored and humbled to be standing here this evening in the presence of so many Johns Hopkins athletes and distinguished alumni and their families. To tell you honestly, I was a little surprised when we received a personal phone call from Coach Petromala who insisted that both Irv and I be on the call together to tell us of the news that both of us were being inducted and included in the 2020 Athletic Hall of Fame class. I say Athletic Hall of Fame class because it was back in 2008 that Irv first received his first nomination after a mere 39 years of dedication to Hopkins Athletics and well before the new Distinguished Service Award designation. Irv was hoping for his name to be included on the Athletic Hall of Fame wall out in the lobby. I, of course, have been there every step of the way to support him and Hopkins. Irv's dedication to Johns Hopkins Athletics rubbed off on me and became a family affair. My two daughters grew up at Homewood Field 
cheering on the Jays with their Sesame Street percussion instruments and kazoos and attending wind ensemble concerts year after year. Now my granddaughters can be seen sitting with the band, playing instruments stored in our Hopkins popcorn bucket from years past and cheering the Jays on to victory. Frankie, my oldest, has even stopped covering her ears when we play the Star Spangled Banner so loud. <laughs> we have collected homecoming mugs from Irv's freshman year in 1969 up through 2019. And as Chris shared, he even snarred one for us when we were in China. Then, no homecoming in 2020. And needless to say, no mug. My daughter Carly, who is here celebrating with us tonight, took it upon herself to have one made so that we could have a mug for 2020 with the inscription JHU Athletic Hall of Fame Induction Class 2020. It was a very special and thoughtful gift and perhaps our most precious homecoming mug in our collection. I am sure you have figured out by my lack of accent that I am not from Balmer. I spent my high school years in South Florida where I played four sports. I came to Maryland in 1975 to attend Goucher College and became part of the Hopkins Pep Band in 1976 when they needed a percussionist. I was a warm body and could read music, both a plus. I did not know anything about lacrosse, however, and my first lacrosse season was in 1977. I was a quick study of the game and fit right in as I learned a variety of cheers and chants as part of the band and the ever popular banana group, one section over, led by Chris Chen, a fraternity brother of Irv's. Chris has been instrumental, however, in providing the passion, continued support, and enthusiasm each and every lacrosse season. It is his responsibility to award team bananas at the end of each lacrosse game to players who have performed well by Chris's standards. Don't ask me what they are, since he has his own metrics for determining this. I don't question it. Tonight, I present Chris. With his own. Team banana. And Chris, it won't spoil, and it doesn't need to be bronzed. It will keep your banana fresh and provide a unique way to carry it into games. Although awarding of the team banana is a tradition reserved for Chris, and only Chris, I hope he doesn't mind if I present one tonight to both Dave Marr and Paul Rabel as they are inducted into the Athletic Hall of Fame as lacrosse players. And they're in there, believe me. And speaking of tradition, there is one last item I would like to share with you. It is the tradition of playing and singing to win after every lacrosse goal. When I use the word tradition here, it means something that came before me and should continue even after I am gone. It is not something that should be changed or messed with, and the lyric should stand the test of time. So much so that I took it upon myself to make cups with the correct words on them and at times will pass out copies of the lyrics occasionally at games. I have had no success, however, in teaching the cheerleaders to use the correct words, but that certainly won't stop me from trying. Hopkins is full of traditions, wonderful and talented athletes and staff. It is full of possibilities for students and alumni to be engaged in all that Hopkins has to offer. Just look at me, the wife of a Hopkins alum, who has watched Hopkins football and lacrosse games for more than 45 years and continue to support all that is Hopkins. We are part of the Touchdown Club and Hopkins Hundreds each year. We proudly wear our Hopkins bling and are so grateful to Nir Grauer for his vision and creativity with the hundreds of NAG designs for Hopkins, the athletic teams, and pep band. We proudly display a special 40th anniversary NAG that Neil drew so that we could present it to Irv after a spring concert, wind ensemble and concert. Many Hopkins lacrosse players were in attendance that night as well. So I conclude by stating, 
I guess Irv and I can be considered a Hopkins tradition. Next year, Irv will be part of the 50th reunion class. We look forward to celebrating on campus for many years to come and supporting all things Hopkins. I thank Coach Petromala and the entire committee for this honor. Go Hop. Dave Marr was born on November 13, 1974 in Greenwich, Connecticut and grew up in Yorktown, New York. Dave was the youngest of five children of Fred and Dorothy Marr. Sister Susan is the oldest and she was followed by brothers Chuck, Doug, Scott, and then Dave. There are 14 years separating Susan and Dave. All five of the Marr kids played sports with Dave playing at different times baseball, basketball, football, and lacrosse. I know it's a bit blurry, but you're probably as stunned as I was to see that football didn't work out for Dave after looking at this gem. Likewise, when you show up to play baseball in jeans and a belt, eh, maybe it's not just your thing. Growing up in Yorktown, Dave became a big fan of all the New York teams. He's a huge Rangers fan and loves the Giants and Mets as well. He and his family still make it down to the garden a couple of times a year to catch the Rangers in action. Dave's athletic career took off at Yorktown High School, where he became a highly sought-after recruit, and his final two schools of choice were Virginia and Johns Hopkins. Absolutely picked the right school. Having been a regular at Homewood Field, and having had the chance to hand in the locker room during older brother Scott's career here at Hopkins, Dave was hooked on the Blue Jays, and he arrived at Homewood in the fall of 1992. Just prior to his freshman year, Dave also had the chance to play for the United States Under-19 team at the World Championships where he helped the team to the gold medal. I had an action shot of Dave I could have used, but the hair. I had to use this photo. He's pictured here at those championships with his dad, Fred. Dave jumped right into the lineup as a freshman and teamed with the two most prolific goal scorers in Johns Hopkins history, both here tonight, Terry Reardon and Brian Piccola, to form one of the top attack trios in the nation and in Johns Hopkins history. Dave would finish his career as Hopkins' all-time career leader in assists. 26 years later, that record has not been seriously challenged. Dave graduated from Johns Hopkins in 1996 after helping the Blue Jays to three trips to the Final Four and twice earning All-America honors. Dave and his wife Marissa, pictured here with their daughters Madeline, with their daughter Madeline and son Liam, met in the seventh grade. And Dave first said he, they were high school sweethearts, and then he corrected himself and he said, "I guess we were middle school sweethearts." Actually, they've been together since 1989. Marissa was actually on Yorktown's first ever girls lacrosse team. She attended Springfield College, and on the weekends, she would take the bus back to Yorktown and then drive to all the Hopkins games with Dave's parents. Madeline and Liam are now both college lacrosse players themselves. Madeline is a junior captain at Skidmore, and Liam is a freshman at Salve Regina. Dave and Marissa are both teachers, and Dave was a high, a high, a high school lacrosse coach at his alma mater, Yorktown. He guided the team to two state championships as the head coach there, Seen here celebrating the 2014 New York State Championship. Dave was actually one of three Mars to play at Hopkins. I'm sure some of you know his older brother, Scott, played here ahead of Dave. And then his nephew, Scott's son, Kyle, played for the Blue Jays from 2016 to 2019. She's not with us tonight, but hopefully she's enjoying the ceremony on our live stream and enjoying this special night with her son, her youngest son, Dave, this is Dave and his mom, Dorothy. For induction into the Johns Hopkins Athletic Hall of Fame, I present Dave Marr.
Okay, uh, I told myself I wasn't going to cry, so I, I cried several times thinking about it. Um, again, uh, thank you for the, the honor to be up here, um, to be honest with you. It's very humbling. Um, uh, if you know me, I'm not big on having any kind of recognition and such. Um, but again, thank you for Johns Hopkins University. Um, Again, it's it's uh, it's humbling. Um, I won't forget to thank my wife because if I did, I would I'd get in trouble. <laughs> so, Maris, thank you. Uh, as um, Ernie was saying, uh, we've been sweethearts since uh, since since I guess first kiss was November 11th, 1988. <laughs> so, uh, at my buddy Jer's house and uh, a little Boston move in the background. So that gave me a little bit of courage. Um, but ever since that time, and uh, you know, taking those trips down with my my dad in the car, I'm sure talking about you know what needed to be done to win the game, and you know, then you know, spending about two hours at the tailgate with a dude with a mullet, and guy tends to lose stuff, and you know, by the end of the four years, she was still there, so I was happy about that. So that was that was tremendous. Um, but again, uh, uh, my life is uh, has been molded by lacrosse. Um, I grew up in a town where lacrosse was, you know, the biggest sport, and uh, I was lucky enough to to come into contact with a, a guy named Charlie Murphy, who was a Princeton grad. Uh, we won't hold that against him, but he was um, a, a very smart man. He actually happened to be a, an alcoholic, and he decided to stop drinking and dedicate his life to uh, creating a lacrosse program in Yorktown, New York. And uh, you know, he was a guy that um, opened his house to us, and uh, you know following my brother down here to Hopkins and, and going in the locker room and um, being able to experience the history. I'm a, I'm a history teacher now and to understand the history of lacrosse and it's been a sport that's been played here for a nearly a thousand years on this continent and then uh, to come to a university where this year will be like 140 years they've been playing here um, is a tremendous um, feeling and uh, a tremendous feeling of accomplishment and um, I'm very proud of that. Um, again, a lot of people to thank because um, I wouldn't be here without so many, so many different people. Um, coach Seaman obviously recruited me here. Um, he was my coach for four years, great man. Uh, coach Petro, who was a coach for me for a couple years, but uh, I've known him since you know, his playing days and my brother was here with him. Uh, coach Dwan, who was a Yorktowner myself, I played with his brother and um, always very supportive with his um, care packages, which was awesome. <laughs> Of, of gear every other year. Um, Coach Cowan's here. I want to thank him for all the support throughout the years and, and coaching me. Um, obviously, my teammates, uh, Picky's here, Terry's here. Um, you know, traveling here just to show their support for me is, is, is extremely humbling, and um, I really appreciate that from them. Um, Billy Evans is here, Danny Evans. A uh, couple of my friends, uh, Johnny Marcus, my roommate for four years, Swatchin and uh, my buddy Brad Burzins and, and guys that I played with and, and have memories that I'll remember for my whole life. Um, my family, uh, obviously Scott, uh, is a big influence in my life in terms of lacrosse and, and, and life. I always wanted to, to be him. Um, uh, my brother Chuck, uh, always up here tutoring me. He was the smart one of the family. Uh, lived in D.C., so it was close, so I got a pizza and a, a lecture on economics, which is awesome. Uh, my brother Doug, who's always running me outside doing ground balls, the dirty work kind of guy. Um, and my sister Sue, who was, uh, is my second mother, and uh, she, she's here tonight. And, uh, and I appreciate them all being here and um, supporting me throughout the years and making a lot of trips and, and, and hearing my, my father talk a lot of lacrosse. Uh, you saw my picture of my dad, Fred. Um, if you knew him, he was uh, probably the biggest you know, lacrosse fan or he's really just a fan of his kids. Uh, super supportive, um, and again, every time I, I would think about him, uh, thinking about the speech, I, I would cry. Um, but it just brings a smile to my face about how excited he would be if he was he was watching me right now, and I know he is. Um, so I just feel tremendously proud that I could be up here uh, and receive this um, recognition. Uh, and again, to my family, uh, Maris, um, she's always been there for me. Uh, my two kids are, are great kids in, in, in college right now, and, and she was really the, the, 
the person behind <laughs> them being so good. Um, I was always running around, you know, I'm a teacher, I'm a coach, and, you know, doing all kinds of duties and everything, and, and she was there with them. Uh, she was my rock. Uh, my mother-in-law, Marge, is home. Uh, Johnny Marcus can attest to this. When we were in college, she would send down her old chicken farm. She's 100% Italian, so he was, uh, it was always nice to get her chicken farms every other weekend when Marissa came down. And, uh, uh, and again, I just want to thank uh, the school. I want to thank the committee um, and, and my teammates and, and my family, and I really appreciate the honor. Thank you. Paul Rabel was born on December 14, 1985, in Gaithersburg, Maryland. He's the second of three children to Alan and Jean Ann Rabel. He's about 20 months younger than older brother Mike, 20 months older than older younger sister Rebecca. Mike took Paul under his wing at a young age and taught him everything he knew, apparently, including how not to share food. Although Paul lived in Maryland growing up, the Rabels had re deep roots in North Carolina and often traveled south. Myrtle Beach was a favorite, de favorite destination spot in the summer. Paul looked thrilled to be there with his mom, Jean Ann, in this particular photo. Having an older brother gives you someone to look up to and want to be like, although prob Paul probably reconsidered that after Mike kept telling him these snazzy yellow polos were all the rage in the early 1990s. Paul and Mike were both very into sports. Paul told me pretty clearly that he and Mike could never be on the same team because they would just fight the entire time, so they had to be separated. Brotherly love, you know? Paul played a number of different sports growing up as a kid, baseball, basketball, and soccer. He also swam and competed in track and field. When Paul went to high school at DeMatha, he he stuck with basketball for just a little bit of time and then gave it up. And I would imagine that that had to be a pretty difficult decision for Paul because who wants to give up being part of the I-270 I gang? <laughs> After giving up basketball, Paul dedicated himself to lacrosse, a sport that would become the centerpiece of not just his high school and college careers, but his entire life. Amazing you hear today about kids that start playing sports, whatever sport they like, at three years old, four years old, five years old. Paul did not actually start playing lacrosse until he was 12. Today, that's unheard of. But he started at the Matha and would go on to become the top recruit in the country. All right, the number four recruit in the country, but you know what, you know what I'm saying. He was recruited by, I would imagine, every top school in the, in the nation at that time. Paul was brought to Homewood by Coach Dave Petromala, who Paul cited as the biggest reason for choosing the Blue Jays over his many suitors, a virtual who's who of the top Division I men's lacrosse programs in the country at the time. At Hopkins, Paul became a four-time All-American, a three-time first-team All-American. He became our career leader in goals and points as a midfielder. He helped the Blue Jays to national championships in 2005 and 2007. Perhaps more impressively, Paul became just the second two-time academic All-American in Johns Hopkins lacrosse history, an honor he shares with 2005 teammate Chris Watson. Paul would go on to represent the United States three times at the ILF World Championships and also carved out impressive prof an impressive professional career both indoor and outdoor lacrosse. As a professional lacrosse player, Paul was gener generally regarded as the best player in the world at times. He won several league championships and guarded numerous individual honors, both indoors and outdoors, during a professional career that spanned from 2008 to 2021. It was later in his playing, late in his playing career that he and brother Mike founded the PLL in 2019 and took the business world of the sport by storm. The Rabels aimed to place a higher priority on the players both in compensation and benefits, and they developed a marketing and media plan that had never seen, been seen in the sport of lacrosse and would grow it to a place it had never been. After crafting one of the great playing careers 
in the history of the sport, Paul has leveraged a strong grasp of media and technology to build a unique professional and personal brand that also make him the most successful entrepreneur and businessman in the sport's history. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present for induction into the Johns Hopkins Athletic Hall of Fame, Paul Rabel. Thank you, Ernie. It's very generous and kind of you. Uh, wow. Getting an opportunity to come up fairly late in the program uh, has rendered me the opportunity to sort of rewrite everything or rethink a lot of it. Um, congratulations to all the inductees. Pretty amazing honor. Um, haven't met a lot of you all, but getting to hear your stories is inspiring. Um, Harvey, what a powerful speech you gave up here. Thank you for your time at Johns Hopkins and all you've done in communities around the world, really. And uh, Ernie mentioned my parents are from North Carolina. We're actually from Winston-Salem. So we were nudging each other while you were up here. Uh, and you saw a photo of me swimming. Yep. Uh, form was decent. Uh, if you still want to get in the pool, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot, but I'm sure you'd kick my ass. Um, so, so on that, uh, I decided to go to Johns Hopkins, uh, as we had mentioned, because of Dave Petromalo who's here tonight. And uh, when he made his visit to our home, because of that Winston-Salem, North Carolina connection, we would have these North Carolina throw pillows in the house. My dad and about 20 or so other Rabel relatives have been through Chapel Hill. And when Petro walked in uh, to sit down on the couch, he took one of them and sat it on the seat cushion and then sat on it. <laughs> And I was like, I want to play for that guy. Uh, my dad wasn't happy with it, but that, that's, that's why, uh, similar to, to Neil Grauer's story, not, not nearly as good, but that's why I went to Johns Hopkins. Uh, so I want to talk about three things. The first are, are really what I got from the institution. Uh, work ethic. It's an incredibly difficult institution to get through, especially as a student athlete, with, which all of us here tonight uh, know very intimately. I learned how to time manage, and that was really difficult, but that learning process over these four years was helpful, and I actually figured out that it's less about managing your time and more about managing your energy. So how you take care of yourself in between those moments and uh, how you're approaching e each task, how present you are, uh, really returns time on a multiple. And, and the third thing that I thought about that I learned from the institution is how to think critically it's actually a company value of the Premier Lacrosse League. Uh, Mike and I talk about it pretty regularly. And it's, it's basically learning to solve for problem sets that you've never seen before. And I remember being uh, terribly difficult to, to figure out my first few exams. I, I was used to studying curriculum and jamming it right before the night, as, as Irvin said, uh, the night of, I should say, before the exam. And then I would see problems inevitably that I never saw in the textbooks. I remember going to see some of my teacher's assistants saying, hey, how, how can I be better because this doesn't seem right? We're learning all this material and the material you're presenting us in an exam is stuff we've never seen before. And that's how you think critically. It's, a, it's being strategic uh, and problem solving based on the skill sets that you're learning over time. So those three things are something that I really apply to what I do today. Um, my brother, who you saw quite a bit of, is my co-founder of the PLL, and uh, he often says that while the public markets may say that your companies are built on how well you put together your P&L, your spreadsheets, companies aren't built on Excel spreadsheets. They're, they're built by the people that you are connected with and the people who you're lucky to work with. And I think that this institution gave us amazing curriculum to learn from, but it's really about the people and the relationships. And there are a number of you here in the room uh, that I'd like to thank and just recognize. Um, the first is Neil Grauer. So Nag was up here, um, and he's an incredible writer. He's also an amazing speaker. You combine the two, and it's, it's very rare. Um, when I walked in, Neil gave me this cigar, apropos. Like, I was one of the early guys. My freshman year actually brought through Chris Watson uh, to visit Neil. 
And uh, he taught me how to smoke my first cigar. And we were back there earlier. As soon as he comes in, I give him a big hug and he gives me a cigar. And we were standing next to someone. I was like, you know, Neil taught me how to cut my first cigar. And he was like, no, I don't cut my cigars. I chew them. And uh, I was like, oh, that's right. That's right. So I'm, I'm always learning from Neil. We'll, we'll, we'll bite this thing off back there tonight. Uh, I'm also one of those with a tattoo of, of his caricature, his blue jay. Um, I will not be in the bathroom <laughs> to take photos. But Neil would often joke. He was like, you know, your partners, your girlfriends, you're, you're going to talk to them about me. Because surely they're going to ask about this blue jay you have along the side of your leg. Um, might have been too much, but I had to carry that. Joe Cowan's here. Amazing what you've done for the school, uh, for our program. Kevin Kilner, uh, I always see you at these events. It's so amazing because uh, there, there are alumnus of Johns Hopkins that give a lot to the program of being in person and showing up. You know, we didn't get to spend much time together when I was an undergrad, but thank you for coming. And I know everyone here recognizes that. Um, David Cordish, we all know uh, him for what he's done in the Baltimore community, uh, but was a Johns Hopkins lacrosse player. His name is etched on the building that unfortunately I didn't get to uh, be a player in, uh, but I definitely admire what everything you've done here for this program. Uh, so thank you. There was a moment in time where we were having, I think, our worst season that led to one of those championship teams. It was 2007. And, and two men uh, who aren't here today, one of them is elsewhere, the other has, has uh, regretfully passed away. It was, our, it was our former president, Brody, and then Jerry Schneidman. And, uh, and I remember we were in the dumps, and, and Coach Petro had set up this practice, and he was like, you know, guys, you all playing like shit. So what we decided to do is bring on some replacements. So we were kind of looking around like, this guy is going to add two players, and I don't know if the, the transfer portal was open or not. And out come running these two kind of older gentlemen. And they had Hopkins helmets on. And it was the president of the university and, and Jerry Schneidman. Uh, and it was an amazing sight to see, like the levity that we brought to the practice field when things were going poorly. And it was a lesson that I've learned. Um, the great Bob Scott, his statue stays out here and it, it feels good to be back on campus and, and be able to walk past him as I entered into this building. Um, Dave Marr, you're a lot like all of the Mars, and I didn't get to spend much time with you, haven't gotten to spend much time with you, but uh, your brother Scotty, who, uh, who I remember now I spent a lot of time with, but it was 2005, I was a freshman. And at, uh, at the Final Fours, you're given these liaisons that are assigned, which are college coaches elsewhere. And, and uh, Scotty was coaching at University of Albany. And so he would ride the bus with us at the Final Four to and from practices. And I didn't know how to approach it because I knew he was an alumnus of Johns Hopkins and he cared about our program, but he had to remain neutral because he was presented that. And every time on and off the bus, he would give me a wink. He'd be like, go kick their fucking ass. And he's like, keep that between us. And I was like, I got you. Um, Janine Tucker, what an amazing tenure you've had here. So good to see you. Janine always checks in on me personally. And I, I envy the, uh, the classes of uh, student athletes that she had. Um, and what an amazing, what an amazing person. Um, to my family and my friend who's here, so Brett Roberts, I know it's painful. I've been working with him for five years. He went to the University of Maryland. That's why it's painful. Um, <laughs> we kicked their ass when I was in school. Um, my father, Gary, uh, you know, you should write speeches for the administration. You do, you do an amazing job. Um, he, uh, he, you said it really all about your father. So I, I wish I could, uh, I could have been as eloquent in, in preparation and sharing how uh, my dad was for me. But a, a lot of that uh, endurance of bringing me to and from practice and always getting into whatever sport that uh, I wanted to in zero pressure. Um, and I love you, Dad. And, and uh, you're still doing that today in a lot of ways. My mother, uh, she is the most loving and empathetic and thoughtful human being. Both of them uh, have been to countless events like these. I don't know why they continue to do it. Um, but 
one of the reasons is I, I often just show up alone, and, and you all are always with me. So I'm so thankful for both of you all, and I, and I love you. Um, championship teams. I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about, uh, you know, what is this all worth? You put in so much effort in a sport uh, to compete for something that more times than not you don't achieve. And when you win, you just want to turn the page and go win again. And it's, it's a very uh, high velocity, difficult thing to process and live in. And I've arrived at the fact in a lot of cases that, you know, when you don't win or when you win, life goes on. And, and, uh, and you just need to keep, take a breath and, and keep going and keep pushing and kind of find center. Um, but when you come to an event like this, what you learn is that those championships, they're so rare. And they're forever. And those forever teams, uh, you know, it, it's, it's something that's just really special. And, and you feel so much gratitude to your coaches, to your teammates. Um, and two of them are here. Dave Petromala, I love you with every piece of fiber and every cell in my body. Uh, what you've done for me as a coach, as a mentor, and most recently as a friend. Um, just being here means a lot. Uh, and then Jamison Kester, who's, who's here now as part of the coaching staff. He was on both of those 2005 and 2007 national championship teams and, and knows what it's like to grind and, and literally bleed uh, and put everything out there to accomplish a goal as a group. Um, Nag had a sip of that flask up here. For those that don't know, he has a tradition where he takes a sip after every Hopkins goal. Um, so I know in 2005, when we were literally wiping the floor with teams, we were an undefeated team, you were drunk, really <laughs> drunk at those games. Uh, <laughs> Irvin Cathy and the Hopkins Band. Hearing, again, hearing you guys come up here and talk is, is, was really special and unexpected. And, um, you know, I found out that it was Chris because I didn't get many bananas. So I want to know what those metrics were. Um, <laughs> but I, I appreciate the, the sentiment of sharing a banana with me. Uh, and we'll talk about Chris later. Um, my final message is, uh, it, it comes from a, an email that I got uh, recently from my dad. And he writes me a lot of emails and it's, it's kind of our way to communicate. Um, and I apologize, I don't respond to all of them. I know you put so much thought into them. Some of those too long did not read. Uh, but it, it's, <laughs> it means a lot. And, and so someone had reached out recently about what Mike and I had done with the PLL and this documentary that just came out and, and his response, he forwarded me his response. And he started with life is messy. Uh, and I think that's, that's a lot of what we've shown and a lot of how I feel about how life progresses and I'm sure we can all share in that there's no straight line. Um, and I, I've, I've come to terms and gotten more comfortable with the messiness of life and the, and, and the unexpected. And uh, to Janine's question, when, when she did give me a hug out there, she said, uh, you know, how are you feeling? And, and are you getting any rest? And are you reflecting on what you've been able to accomplish? So I think that just having an opportunity to come up here and listen to all of the inductees and everyone speak is, is such a great moment to reflect. And if you think about managing energy, it gives me a lot of energy uh, to then go back out there and, and hopefully feel it's the same for a lot of you all. Um, life is, is more about endurance than it is strength and speed. And, and all of us getting here and at this moment today and being inducted is, is a true testament to that endurance. So uh, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. It, it means the world to be inducted and Johns Hopkins will always hold a very big place in that heart. So go hop.
So I actually made a switch in the photos for Paul there. At the very end there, I got a little off kilter because I thought I was substituting. I actually just added one and it threw me off a little bit, but you got some great photos there. That he, we were able to see Paul at various points during his, uh, his life. Little Bobby Van Allen was born on May 1st, 1976, right here in Baltimore at Sinai Hospital. He looks exactly the same now as he did back then. Seriously, he looks exactly the same now as he did then. Bobby is the middle of the three sons of Linda and Ted. His oldest brother, Greg, is two years older, and younger brother, Randall, is six years younger. Bobby's parents were both athletes. His dad ran track, and his mom played tennis. Like most Maryland families, there were plenty of trips to the beach on the summer circuit. The Van Allens also enjoyed camping and made regular trips up to New York to the Adirondacks. The summer trips were, of course, a welcome break from the harsh winters of Baltimore. Bobby, seen here with his spindly physique and really cool mittens, was always ready to help out whenever he could. Growing up, Bobby played baseball, a lot of baseball and basketball in typical BVA fashion. He was very quick to note that his younger brother, Randall, was actually the best athlete of the three Van Allen boys. You may be surprised to hear that the wiry Van Allen also loved to play football, and his football career lasted all the way until his freshman year of high school, when a broken shoulder ended that football career. It was only after that injury did Bobby actually begin to run. That injury actually ended his baseball career as well. So Bobby turned to running at Centennial High School, where he started competing in both track and cross country. And you think about it, if that injury didn't happen, Bobby, when I talked to him, said he probably wouldn't have started running. He would have kept playing baseball and football. And if that were the case, the most successful Division III women's cross country coach in history would still be Cortland coach Jack Daniels. Now, there's really no reason for me to mention that, except the guy's name is Jack Daniels, and I had to get it in there. <laughs> Bobby's dad had attended Michigan State, and although Bobby grew up about 40 minutes from College Park, he was more a fan of sport, uh, sport, uh, Sparty than Testudo. Still, when it came time for college, the lore of running in the ACC and a mechanical engineering program at College Park really drew Bobby. The clincher in his decision on his recruiting trip, he went to a Maryland men's basketball game and they beat Tim Duncan and Wake Forest that night. Bobby was sold. A little more than a year after graduating from Maryland, Bobby landed at Homewood and was named the head cross country coach by then director of athletics, Tom Calder. Truth be told, Bobby told me he had no interest in coaching at the time, but he was just out of school, opportunity knocked and he answered. As you can see in your program, the transformation of our track and cross country program under Bobby's leadership has been remarkable. Seven NCAA women's, lacrosse, women's cross country championships, more than 50 conference titles, and he's coached nearly 150 All-Americans. The job at Hopkins was not exactly full time back then, so Bobby supplemented his income by bartending. At least that's what he told me he did. I don't know what he's doing here. It was actually while working at a bar that Bobby would meet wife Lindsay in 2007. So I connected the dots after our conversation. If Tom Calder hadn't been underpaying Bob so, ba so badly, Bobby would have never met his wife because he wouldn't have been working as a bartender. Bobby and Lindsay were married in 2011 right here on the Hopkins campus on the president's lawn and Lindsay works in branding and marketing with Theralogix. Bobby and Lindsay have two kids, Olivia is seven, Avery is now in kindergarten. Ladies and gentlemen, for induction into the Johns Hopkins Athletic Hall of Fame, I present the head coach with more NCAA championships than any coach in Johns Hopkins history, Bobby Van Allen. But uh, thank you, Ernie. Thanks, thanks for all the great photos. Um, you know, 
Ernie told me a couple things when he said, one, you better keep this under five minutes. You're going to go second to last. You get to follow two Hall of Fame lacrosse athletes. Thanks for that again. And then he said, just make sure I can uh, lend you all those great outfits I had back in my early five, six-year-old days. They're yours, man. I put a drum on your office. So have at it, Ernie. Um, but uh, here I am. Um, again, I, I, being a track guy, I'm on a stopwatch. So put that watch on me. I'll try to keep this under five minutes because open bar ends in seven, by the way. Um, so yeah, 23 years ago, Brian King, he was actually the head track coach here at the time. He asked me, he's like, I just need somebody to help out for like six months. You don't have physical therapy school starting until the following fall. It's like, yeah, sure, why not? Let's come in here. Um, and then uh, right at the end of the season at our banquet, he announces to the team, I'm retiring. This is going to be your new coach. We never even talked about that. <laughs> My mom's all upset. She's like, the hell you are. Like, you're not taking a job for 1500 bucks. <laughs> you're going to school. So, uh, yeah, so that was the start of it. Um, I know it's crazy, but thank you, Brian. He, every, every meet we'd go to, he was like, this is going to be the next Hall of Fame track coach. This is the man. That's it. He walked into Tom Carter's office and said, I'm leaving. You better hire Bobby. Tom sat me down. I I'm shaking. I'm nervous. I'm 22 years old. And he's like, all right, look, you're going to be able to always have a job here as a head track and field coach under two conditions. One I can't mention today. Ernie told me not to mention it. <laughs> the other was he's like, don't overspend your budget, which was like this big anyway. So first year, I overspent my budget by 10000 <laughs> And uh, I'm still here, so uh, I guess it was OK. So but again, uh, thank, you, <laughs> thank you, TC, for really believing me. He always said, I, I know that we can have a good cross country and track program. And for Brian King, um, for really giving me the opportunity and stepping down so uh, I can take over this. Um, it, it was a rough start, but it was fun. Um, I, again, thanks for blurring out my uh, F Duke shirt, by the way. So uh, <laughs> I don't know why that's appropriate after everybody, but uh, it's all good. Um, but uh, you know, I've been so fortunate. This is so more, again, our team success is well beyond me as a coach. I've now worked for three absolutely amazing athletic directors that just believe so much into Hopkins Athletics. For everybody that's here, you get it. Um, for those that are supporting Hopkins Athletics, I think you're starting to get it. Um, this is so unique of a, a situation of a place where we're always just collaborative. Talking with, you know, Bill Nelson when I got to share an office across the time, always coming in after every meet, how did it go, what can you do better, collaborating with the basketball coach. Our athletic director now, Jen Baker, Jen, I love you, you are so supportive I don't think everybody understands that every time we got an athletic director, it's always like, I know I'm following great athletic directors. What can I do more? Um, I don't know any other school where the athletic director is meeting with every single sports athlete, with every single coach, every single month. And every single one of those conversations starts with, how can I help you? What can we do more? What can we do better? You need 70,000 Alter G treadmills? Okay, that was a little stretch, but uh, we find a way we got it done. So um, thank you, Jen. I'm just so honored. Um, thanks to my team that's in the back sitting around waiting. Wings up, by the way, guys. So uh, um, you guys have helped build this. Um, I have had so many amazing assistant coaches. I never really got to learn under any other head coaches. I didn't have the intern, then the assistant coach. I got thrown in and didn't know what the hell I was doing. So I kind of did it in reverse. I hired great assistant coaches for the last 23 years. Um, Kim Lunas got to come in here in 2012. And right away, she won a, a cross-country title in her first year. And I was like, it's not you, Bobby. It's all about Kim. And you're probably right. Kim's now the head coach at Navy. But uh, she taught me so much. But then my two current assistant coaches uh, that helped me out, Shed that's in the back. Shed's awesome. He's my right-hand man. He is there to support me in every single way possible. And my assistant coach, Mara, that really sit there and believe in everything that we're doing. Um, this isn't about me. I get to be the figurehead of 23 years of athletes. As Ernie mentioned, all those All-Americans. I know the first time I read one, and I want to read so many of your names. Thanks for all texting me online that you're watching. But then I got to read 150 of them. Um, but thank you all for giving your heart and soul into Hopkins Athletics. I do have a couple big thank yous. Um, 
you know, my, my family's been th with me through this all. Um, you know, I appreciate that my father, my brother get to be here. Um, and, and, you know, yeah, Randall is by far the better athlete than all of us. Um, but, uh, you know, my, my dad for constantly believing in me, for my mom that can't be here today, for making so many sacrifices. Um, you know, and no, I'm not moving back into your basement, even at, you know, 46 years old. Um, we'll make it work. Um, but always sat there, believed in me, and whatever we could do that we could, uh, I could fulfill this dream. Um, but really, the biggest thanks I have is to my wife, Lindsay. Um, I can tell you right now, being the wife of a track and field coach might be the hardest job in the world. Um, probably being the, the spouse of any college coach where, you know, we have two amazing children. I, I love Olivia and Avery. They take up all my time. And then I say, oh, by the way, we have 120 other new kids this year as well. Um, and we got to sit there and return text messages and counseling. And I love them all. I love all of you for everything that you've given me. I love Hopkins for everything that's given. I, I really will be forever a Blue Jay. Um, so thank you for all everybody being here. Thanks for all the uh, great other inductees into this Hall of Fame. And forever Blue Jay, go Hop. You know how hard it is to go $10,000 over budget when your budget is $2,000? <laughs> Bobby figured out how to do it, though. I can't think of a better person to finish this off and back clean up than one of the great power hitters in Johns Hopkins baseball history. Paul Winterling was born right here in Baltimore on July 31st, 1983, and is the oldest of five children of Paul and Connie Winterling. He's the only boy among the five. He has younger sisters, Tiffany, Brooke, and twins, Amber and Sabrina. After disappointingly missing out on the disco craze of the 1970s, Paul began his baseball career at a young age and would play the game he loved for more than 20 years. Paul was a dominant player with great size, even as a kid. Now, Paul did a great job when he sent me his photos of labeling all the photos so I could, it was so easy for me to figure out where they were, what was going on. This particular one he labeled as 5 age 11, which I think means Paul's 11 and the catcher is 5, because there's no way that they're the same age in this photo. Paul and his family did many of the same things that other families do. They made their annual pilgrimage to Ocean City and spent plenty of time on the summer baseball circuit. He's pictured here with his family at the Atlanta Braves Spring Training Facility. Paul was not the only great athlete in his family. He was quick to point out that his sisters were also great athletes. Paul is actually not the first winterling to get inducted into their College Hall of Fame this year. Younger sister Brooke was inducted into the Frostburg State Athletic Hall of Fame earlier this year after an All-American volleyball career. In fact, at one point, Paul told me that half of the volleyball starting lineup was made up of winterlings. <laughs> how many of you are trying to figure out how many people are on the court in volleyball at one time? There's six. So three of the six were named winterling. Baseball brought Paul many great experiences, including the opportunity to play at Camden Yards in the local senior high school all-star game, where he had the opportunity to meet Oriole Hall of Famer Cal Ripken. I told you Paul had great size. Cal's about 6'5". Paul's in high school, and they're virtually looking eye to eye in this photo. Paul's choices to play baseball in college, coming out of nearby McDonough, came down to Dartmouth and Johns Hopkins. The Blue Jays had an ace in the hole. Paul's college counselor at McDonough, Johns Hopkins Hall of Famer Alice Margraf. Now, if that didn't clinch it, Coach Babb knows how to recruit. He put the hard sell on Paul, and Paul remembered this being his closing, closing line. If you go to Dartmouth, you won't get on a field until May. <laughs> so Paul, br Paul brought his talents to Homewood and became one of the great power hitters in school history, as I mentioned earlier. He ranked in the top five in school history in numerous categories when he graduated, was an all-conference and all-region player, the 2000, 2003 Centennial Conference Player of the Year. And he led the Blue Jays during his four years to a remarkable record 
of 141 and 29. That is the winningest four-year period by winning percentage in school history. And we've had some pretty remarkable four-year runs under the direction of Coach Babb. Paul would go on to play minor league baseball and enjoyed a four-year career that saw him play both for the Aberdeen Ironbirds and the Frederick Keys. Pretty cool to grow up, grow up in Baltimore and two of your destinations in the minor leagues are Aberdeen and Frederick. We had quite a run of Blue Jay players during that era, during Paul's time, who went on to play minor league baseball. He's pictured, pictured here with Rob Sanzillo and Matt Ryder, who also overlapped with him. Paul actually took his power game to the Lynx. He would compete in long drive competitions and was a finalist in the World Long Drive Competition not long after his baseball career ended. Paul later co-founded and is the chief success officer at ViMed, a virtual health delivery platform for top healthcare organizations. Paul and his wife Melissa met in 2010 at a party hosted by former teammate Brian Eberly. This photo was taken on top of a mountain in Switzerland just after Paul proposed. They were married in 2015, and if you look close enough, you might see that the officiant at his wedding was none other than another former teammate, Mike Spichierich. And yes, I said Mike's last name correctly. Paul, by the way, between Ebbs and Spitch, you know, one introduces you to her, the other marries you. I think you owe, I think you owe them. Paul and Melissa have two children, two-year-old son, Bo, and three-month-old daughter, Nora. So he's a two-year-old and a three-month-old. When I talked to Paul last week, you may not be surprised, Paul sounded exhausted. So this ceremony, as you all know, was supposed to take place in March of 2020. Then the pandemic hit, and we delayed, and we delayed again. Here we are tonight. So you see Bo here in this picture. This isn't long ago. Obviously, Nora's just three months old. But this is Bo now. This is Bo in March of 2020, in case you were wondering how much kids change in such a short period of time. Ladies and gentlemen, for induction into the Johns Hopkins Athletic Hall of Fame, it's my privilege to introduce Paul Winterling. Thank you, Ernie. In our pregame meeting, Ernie told me tonight that I was batting cleanup, and you all heard that. Um, and to most people, that means you're going last. But to a baseball player, you're supposed to be hitting fourth. So you have to forgive me, because I'm not used to hitting at the bottom of the lineup. <laughs> so let's pretend that the bases are loaded. It's the bottom of the ninth, and we're down by three. But actually, who am I kidding? This is Hopkins baseball. It's a home game. We didn't get a hit in the bottom of the ninth, because we, we always had the lead. Uh, so my, my teammates and I, we were a pretty confident group, uh, and Coach Babb fueled that confidence. Um, before each game, he would tell us how many runs we were going to spot the other team. Because we didn't just expect to win, we expected to win big. As you can imagine, winning 141 ball games over four years was a lot of fun. But I honestly had just as much fun off the diamond. Uh, I start smiling the moment I step on campus, and that smile gets even bigger as I walk up to the Athletic Center. I practically, practically lived in this building. When I wasn't in the batting cages, uh, the weight room, or the track, I spent time as a lifeguard, a pool operator. I was the scoreboard operator for men's basketball games. I was the DJ for women's basketball games, line judge for volleyball, ball boy for soccer and field hockey. Uh, but above all, I really enjoyed uh, working the chain game for Coach Margaret's football team. Uh, and joining me here tonight, I've got Brian Everly, Brian Morley, Russ Berger, uh, Mike Spitcherich is not here, um, and Tim Casal. We were all in the chain game, and we were the definition of home field advantage. Um, you guys know what I mean by that. <coughs> uh, and on top of that, I, I worked in the front office for Krista Wilson, uh, worked with Ernie, archiving statistics, uh, refereed intramural sports for Gabby Castellana, so I truly spent all of my time here in the athletic center. Uh, and it was an honor and a privilege getting to meet the entire staff and the coaches, coaches for all the sports. And I learned very quickly how lucky I was to be a Blue Jay and a member of the Johns Hopkins family. Uh, to this day, I, in walking back to the halls today, I, I miss 
getting caught by Mosky in a 15 minute conversation. I was trying to drop off my laundry. I miss recapping the prior day's game with, uh, with Daryl, Horace, and Nate in sports um, in the facilities office. And I miss playing noontime hoops with Coach Babb and Brad Moncastle. And above all, I, I miss spending quality time with my teammates. Uh, and as you heard in Ernie's intro, I was introduced to my wife, uh, Melissa, by Brian Eberle and his wife, Lauren, who are here tonight. Uh, they also, uh, they're Hall of Fame matchmakers. They introduced uh, Brian Morley to his wife and Steve Eno, another teammate, to his wife. So for that, I think they deserve a round of applause. Uh, joining Everly as a groomsman in my wedding were teammates Matt Ryder, uh, my best man who played AAA for the Tigers, uh, Eric Nigro, who's here tonight, who once homered three times in a ball game, uh, Mike Spicieric, who officiated our wedding, also homered three times in a ball game. And I bring this up because we used to relentlessly tease Mike Dergala, uh, the late Mike Dergala, about the fact that he was only capable of hitting two homers in a game. Uh, thank you, Tim Denny, for being here tonight. I always look forward to seeing you at the, uh, the decathlon every summer. Uh, and then the support of the Hopkins community continued when I graduated, and really when I needed it the most. As I was grinding out a career as a minor leaguer, uh, Coach Babb hired me to coach fall baseball. And Gilly Babb, the team's GM, once actually hired Matt Ryder and I to build a fence at our school. Uh, the fence was so poorly, poorly built, it was deemed a safety hazard. <laughs> and she had to pay somebody else to take it down. So, sorry, Gilly. Um, and Gilly also helped us find housing one off-season uh, with her uncle David. Um, and the following off-season, I want to thank Greg Girardi for providing us housing. Uh, and the following off-season, I played four years in the minors, um, I want to thank uh, Rob Petroforti, Joe Zakaria, and Nate Edelman, who let me crash on their couch. Uh, however, they did owe me one. Uh, as freshman, I was their RA, and that was the first year I started losing my hair. Uh, but the people who supported me the most over the years were my parents. Um, they're both here tonight. They aren't just my parents, they were my coaches, my cheerleaders, my Uber drivers, and my promoters. Of the thousands of hours and miles they logged, there are numerous memories, but there are really two for me that stand out that I think are very unique. Uh, one being that I learned to drive a car on a baseball field. Uh, my dad would drive me over to the local school, and he threw me batting practice until it got dark. Um, and when it came time to pick up the 60 plus baseballs buried in the tall grass, he would literally let me drive his car on the field with the high beams on, and we'd scoop up the balls as you would a golf ball out of a golf cart. Uh, for story two, uh, as Ernie mentioned, I have four younger sisters, uh, or shall I say four outfielders, who help shag baseballs. Um, my local middle school and elementary school were literally right next to each other. So after school, as a middle schooler, we'd end before the elementary school and drive over there take batting practice, and literally during school hours when they would come out between classes for recess, they would continue to shag baseballs. Uh, and to this day, I have no doubt that they could catch a 90 mile an hour bas baseball hit off a bat. So my mom and dad, they also always preached the value of a good education. And I was fortunate enough to receive a scholarship to McDonough High School. And as McDonough's coach, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, Alice Margaret was my college counselor who really nudged me towards, towards Hopkins. And four years ago, um, Alice and Jim and I were sitting here as Jeremy Brown was getting inducted. Uh, and Jeremy was not only my high school teammate, but my, my college teammate. So that's back-to-back -back Hall of Fame draft picks for Alice. So I think Alice also deserves a round of applause. Uh, and honestly, prior, prior to Jeremy, it was also uh, Yanni Rosenberg nearby, uh, Gilman grad. Well, we won't hold that against him. Uh, that's three, three in a row in the local Baltimore area. Uh, and now, Jeremy and I, while we're in the Hall of Fame here, neither of us were inducted into the, into the McDonald Hall of Fame. And I'm not surprised and I'm not disappointed. Uh, we were good ball players in high school, but at Hopkins, Coach Babb made us great. So thank you, Coach. And thanks to all my teammates whose names I didn't mention tonight. Uh, and lastly, I want to thank my wife, Melissa, who's in the back with our daughter, Nora. Um, thank you for all the love and support. And I hope we're back on campus in 18 years to see Bo and Nora on the athletic fields. So thank you all. Have a good night.
So how many people do you think Alice Margraf has nudged towards Hopkins through the years, by the way? I'd like to congratulate all of our honorees tonight. It was truly special to hear all of the stories that you shared, how impactful your time at Hopkins was, and we're thankful for all of you that could be here to share this night with them. I hope you all enjoyed tonight's ceremony. I'd like to give a couple of thanks here before I wrap up. A special thanks to Susan DeMuth and the Alumni, Alumni Association here at Johns Hopkins for co-sponsoring this event. Our partnership with the Alumni Association and students, Susan's passion for athletics, really everything we do here relies on so many people and Susan is right at the top of the list in terms of support for our department. So thank you very much to Susan and the Alumni Association. I'd also like to thank our Blue Jays Unlimited staff, our Senior Associate AD for Development, Grant Kelly, our Director of Athletic Development, Meredith Rosenblatt, Associate Director, Stephanie Littleton, and our Assistant Directors, Annie Kugel and Sophia Masek. They do all the work that makes this event happen and look the way it does. When I tell you we're having an event in the gym, I'm sure some of you are like, mm, this is remarkable, and it's all because of their handiwork. So thank you all to our Blue Jays Unlimited staff. If we could have all the inductees when we break here in a moment, please come forward. We'd like to get a picture of the group all together and all former inductees who are here tonight. If you could come forward uh, to be a part of some photos as well. Thank you all for coming. I hope you had a great time. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.